Welcome back. This is part two of the Decision Tree workshop using the Orange Data Mining tool. In this workshop, we will be building a Decision Tree model. Let's start with a recap of what we did in workshop part one. We started by importing the data into Orange, and then we specified the correct data types and then we did some data exploration. We use a couple of widgets here. We use the feature statistics widget to give us the summary statistics. We also look at the distributions, which means that the shape of the data using the histograms. And then we also look at the scatter plot to see if there are any significant correlation between two variables. And finally, we also printed out the correlation table. Now that we have a better understanding of the data, we can proceed to do our model building, which is today's workshop. Let's get started with part two. We will go through the following steps to build our decision tree model. The first step is to do feature selection. The second step is to split the data into training and testing sets. In the third step, we are going to train the decision tree model using the training data set. And in step four, we will view the results of the training. And step five, we will check the accuracy of the model. And step six, we will save the model for prediction purposes or deployment. I've already set up the workflow here with four widgets re referring to the four steps in the part two. So step one is feature selection, and we are going to be using the widget called select columns. In step two, we are splitting the data into training and testing, and we are going to use the data sampler widget. And then we want to build the tree using the tree widget, and we will view the results of the constructed tree using the tree viewer. Let's start by looking at feature selection. You can see that Orange has actually done some auto detection and pre-selected all my numeric features and placed them in a box on the right side. Orange has also cleverly anticipated that outcome will become my target variable. You can choose to change these pre-selections if they are not exactly what you want. For example, if I don't want to use BMI as an input to train my decision tree model, I would drag it to the left box where orange would ignore. Anything you place in the left box is actually going to be ignored by orange. And anything you choose to put on the right box will be used as input to train the model. But for now, I will use all my features to build the decision tree model. As you can probably guess, this widget is useful for fine tuning your model by selectively removing features that do not contribute to the tree building. Technically, we want to remove features that have low correlation with the target variable. The next step is to split the data set into training and testing sets. At the top, you can see that the default is to split the training to be 70% and the testing to be 30%. There are other options as well that you can choose to use for your data sampling. You can fix a sample, you can do cross-validation, you can also do bootstrapping. You can find all these descriptions in the help file. Here you can see in the help file that it will explain to you all the different parameters. I will not go through this right now, but you can read it up on your own. Going back to my data sampler, I would like to talk a little bit about replicable deterministic sampling. In replicable deterministic sampling, 
It simply means that your training and your testing sets are going to be held constant and permanently. Now, this is necessary and important if you want to avoid surprises. Supposing you train your decision tree to an accuracy of 80% and you're very pleased with it. The next day, you ran a demo for your stakeholders and to your horror, the accuracy became 75%. Now, this happened because the training data set that was generated yesterday is not the same as the training data set that you have um, generated today. The composition of the training and the testing is not the same as the original. Therefore, you are getting different results. If you want to fix this, you should check the box that says replicable deterministic sampling. So the 70% and the 30% will always remain the same, no matter how many times you run the model. In the second option, it's called stratify the sample. This is where you want the proportion of the class labels to be the same. So supposing in our data set, we have 65% of diabetic patients and 35% of non-diabetic patients. I would want the training and the testing to have a similar proportion so that the tree model can learn this property. So you would want to check the stratify sample as well. Finally, click on the sample data and you can see at the bottom over here that out of the 768 um, data points that I have, 538 will be used for training and 230 records will be used for testing. Okay. The next note is the tree widget. You can see that there are a few parameters that you can configure the tree modeling. If you want to produce a binary tree, you can check this box. A binary tree can sometimes produce better results than a multi-way split. You can use this to experiment. Next is the minimum number of instances in the leaves. This tells the model that every node in the tree should have a minimum of two data points. Next is do not split subsets that are smaller than, in this case, five. This tells the model not to split if the data points in a node is less than five. Hence, if the node contains six data points, the model can split them into four and two. In the next iteration, these two nodes with four and two data points in them will not be processed for splitting. The next parameter is to limit the depth of the tree. This is a difficult parameter to configure. In the literature, there are suggestions to set the limit to log base two of the number of features. But for the purpose of this workshop, I'm going to be leaving it as the default. Finally, you can set a stopping criteria. Whenever there is 90% majority class present in a node, it will not be processed for splitting. Now we are done with configuring the tree building. Now that the tree model has been trained, let's view the results of the tree model construction using the tree viewer widget. You can see that glucose is the root node. So the first split is on glucose levels. On the left split are patients with glucose levels of less than or equals to 123. On the right split, these are patients with glucose levels of greater than 123. You can notice that there are actually three leaf nodes here. The first leaf node is over here. The second leaf node is over here. And the third leaf node is over here. These three leaf nodes are decision nodes. And the color blue implies that these are non-diabetic decisions. So let's take a trace of one of these paths and see how a decision has been made. 
Patients with glucose levels less than or equals to 123 and with BMI less than or equals to 26.9 are 98.8% of the time non-diabetic. This represents 84 out of 85 patients. Another path here on the right side are patients with glucose levels greater than 123 whose, whose glucose levels are less than or equals to 157. This would mean that patients over here are patients with glucose levels greater than 123 but less than 157. And if their BMI is less than 26.2, 95.2% of the time, they are non-diabetic. This represents 20 out of 21 patients. Okay, so next we want to look at the accuracy of this decision tree. In order for us to check the model accuracy, we would need another widget called test and score. Okay, here I found it. And I want to connect the data sampler to the test and score widget, as well as the tree model to the test and score widget. Another thing I need to do is to set up the data flow by clicking on the link. This is the window. So data sample represents the 70% training data and that will be passed on as data for the test and score. There is the 30% remaining data that will be used for testing the model to provide us with the accuracy. And I will link that remaining data to the test data. With this correctly set up, I can now view the results of the model. So here we can see that the model has achieved an accuracy of 73.5%. This may or may not be within your threshold. Um, many a times, this decision of whether it is sufficient will depend upon the domain that you're operating on and the problem that you're trying to solve. For instance, if you are predicting customer churn or predicting whether a customer will respond to a marketing campaign, you may be able to live with anywhere from 70 to 80%. However, if you are dealing with a medical condition, predicting a medical condition, like if a person has COVID or if a person is diabetic, uh, you might have to look at a, a higher prediction accuracy, maybe 80, 90 or 90 plus percent. So whatever percentage that you choose will really depend upon the, the criticalness of your prediction results. Okay, so supposing I am happy with a 73.5%, I would now need to save my model so that I can use this model to predict patients, new patients that will be coming to see me. For that matter, I will need another widget called Safe Model. And I will link the decision tree model to the Safe Model. And here, if I were to click on it, it would allow me to save the model at a location that I want. So say I want to save this as diabetes. All right, so I will save this model as diabetes.pickle file. Okay. So in the next workshop, we are going to talk about model deployment, where I will be loading this safe model and using it to predict new patients, patients that have never been classified as either diabetic or non-diabetic. And I will rely upon the decision tree model to, to help me to do that prediction.